and I've met uh, a lot of the families who participate in this program. And most of them, Jan, are, they're single mothers. Th there are no dads. Uh, and it's these single mothers uh, who have, you know, working two, three jobs, um, who, are, who are zoned for really, really horrible schools. And uh, when you meet these families, and you meet these women, and you see what it is they're trying to do for their child, and everything that they are trying to do to try to get their child into a better environment, a better life, um, it's remarkable. And, um, and, and we, <laughs> we always try to raise this with, uh, you know, with, with some of the folks who represent the unions. Because uh, every now and then we'll, we'll be on panels with these folks. And, um, and we'll say to them, you know, why is it that you can't just, why, why is it that you are so opposed uh, to having low-income families, having the same uh, educational opportunities that you did or that a wealthy family does? This is not right. Can giving children more options for their K-12 schooling help rectify America's ailing education system? Does school choice help or hurt kids with from poor or disadvantaged backgrounds? And what kinds of funding and schooling opportunities are currently available to families who want to try something different? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Jan Jekielek. In this episode, we sit down with school choice advocate John Schilling, president of the American Federation for Children. He previously worked for the Arizona Department of Education and was chief of staff for the Education Leaders Council in Washington, D.C. He also worked on education for the Arnold Schwarzenegger gubernatorial campaign. John Schilling, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Thank you. Thank you for having me. John, so you've been in this realm of education reform for, I guess, over two decades now. And I, I saw some recent stats, which honestly I found really, really disturbing. Uh, it's something to the tune of one third of kids, high school and below, are not reading, writing, and doing math at their own grade level. Okay, this, and please, tell me if that's right. And also, if, if so, and I think it is, it feels like an epic disaster almost. I mean, how, how can this even be possible? What's going on here? So, Jan, it, it is an epic disaster. And, uh, you know, we have one measurement that we call the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Uh, and the most recent one uh, was last year in 2019. And what that, what that exam told us, and it's a snapshot, and it's given in all 50 states, uh, what that exam told us is that uh, two-thirds, two-thirds of fourth and eighth graders are not reading at grade level. Uh, and even worse than that, you have almost a third of fourth and eighth, of fourth and eighth graders uh, who are scoring at the below basic level. Now, below basic is failing. Uh, so that's another perfect example of why this really is a system in crisis. I, how did we get here? I mean, you've been trying to reform the system, so presumably it wasn't in tip-top shape 20-odd years ago. How, have things been getting worse, and how did it get here? So in some respects, things have been getting worse, and in other respects, things have been getting better. So I think the bell was really rung on this. Back in 1983, uh, there was a report called A Nation at Risk, uh, and it was commissioned by the Reagan administration. Uh, at the time, Bill Bennett uh, was the Secretary of Education, and that was really the, the alarm bell, uh, where we realized that we had millions of children uh, who were failing to be educated, and it was a real problem. Uh, and over the course of the last, uh, you know, since 1983, uh, you've had a number of uh, administrations that have come and gone. Everybody's tried to do their thing. Uh, the Clinton administration had something called Goals 2000. Uh, the Obama administration had something called Race to the Top. So everybody sort of had a plan. Uh, but I think one of the things that, um, that has been consistent over this period of time is there's been kind of a, a, a sort of a subgroup of, of education reformers uh, who have started in the states, it all starts with governors, uh, who have really taken the bull by the horns and said, you know what, we need to shake up the system a little bit. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we believe is essential for, for shaking up the system is to make sure that every family in America uh, has the freedom to choose the best educational environment for their child. Because if you start there, because we know that every child is different. We know that every child has unique needs. But if you give families the freedom uh, to choose the best educational environment for their child, uh, we believe that that's going to give the child the best opportunity to learn. 
You know, this, this really resonates with me, actually, because a, as a kid, I was in a school that didn't work for me. I don't know if it was a bad school or a good school, but I kind of forced my parents to put me in a different school. So, and we had the opportunity, thankfully. I, you self-chose, and they I, went I, along. I self-chose, <laughs> they went along with it. I was very determined, but actually it was quite important, and it, it, I think, changed my life in a very positive way. So, now, why is the school choice thing controversial? It seems to me like an obvious thing we would want mm -hmm. to offer, mm -hmm. right? It's controversial because um, education in America, K-12 education, is about a $700 billion enterprise. Uh, and there are a lot of adults in the system who, who, who like things the way they are. Uh, there are entrenched interests, uh, such as the National Teachers Unions, who like the way things are. Um, when you look at uh, support for educational choice, uh, it, it, it is hard to find an issue that has more bipartisan support and more support across all demographics. So we're talking about, you know, 57% of Democrats, 69% of independents, 84% of Republicans, 82% of Latinos, 68% of African Americans, 71% of Millennials. It's hard to find an issue where you have such broad support for something. So why has it been so difficult? Normally, when politicians and policymakers see numbers like this, there is a rush to enact something, to respond to all this demand. Uh, and the reason, that, that, that's, the reason that, that has not happened enough on this issue is because of these entrenched interests. And, you know, candidly, the, the, the teachers' unions are the principal funder of the Democratic Party in America, and they pour millions of dollars into these races. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that uh, the families who are benefiting from these, uh, largely African American and Latino families, who are constituents of many Democratic policymakers across the country, uh, the, the power and the influence of the union is preventing these policymakers uh, from responding to the will of these voters. We're hoping to change that. But you know, it's not just uh, you know Democrats or some Democrats, obviously, that are that are against this, right? There's there's prom I think some quite prominent Republican lawmakers. That unquestionably, are also, unquestionably. Yeah, that, how does that work? So we have uh, we have some rural Republicans uh, around the country uh, who are you know not big fans of educational choice. Uh, some of this is due to um, you know being in rural areas where uh, the influence of district superintendents and school board members, uh, school district uh, school districts are very large employers uh, in congressional districts and in legislative districts, and so they carry a lot of weight with these policymakers. And so the districts who really have no um, there's really no interest on their part to see other educational options because that would mean students would be leaving uh, the traditional public schools. And they put a lot of pressure on these rural lawmakers. Uh, so I, I would say that rural Republicans are a work in progress. Um, there's, also, uh, there's also been some challenges with suburban Republicans. Um, who are very satisfied. They live in, you know, they represent nice districts where they have uh, very good public schools, and so there's no reason to have choice. Uh, and, and, you know, and one of the things that we always say to people is, you know, so me as an education reformer, I work on school choice. Folks will often say to me, well, you think that choice is just the great silver bullet, right? It will change everything. And all we say is, well, choice is an essential component uh, to fundamental education reform. It's one piece of the puzzle. It's an essential piece, uh, but it's, it's not the only piece. So, you know, our view is we want to make sure that every family can choose the best educational environment for their child. And that could be the public school down the street because it's a good school, it's a good fit for that child. It may be a charter school, it may be a private school, it may be home school, it may be a virtual school. We just want to put the power in the hands of the families. You know, it just occurred to me, you mentioned this is a $700 billion, you know, industry, if you will, education. Um, so this comes down to, you know, every student is worth money, right, mm -hmm. to whatever organization is involved, mm -hmm. I suppose. So if suddenly the, the, the challenge is if the, for the existing organizations, do I have this right, that if suddenly everyone is choosing 
different options, private options, charter options, this kind of stuff, then suddenly the, their revenues go down? Is, is, that, is it as simple as that? or? Or what? Uh, well, the revenues would go down for the t for the unions uh, because charter schools, most charter schools are not unionized. Private schools are not unionized, and you know one hates to be cynical about these kinds of things, but. Um, a huge reason that the union uh, really, uh, a huge reason the union opposes private school choice uh, and are not big fans of charter schools is because there's no dues in it. There's no money in it. And again, you, you know, you hate to be cynical about this, uh, but that is a reality. So can you break down for me what the difference is between private, charter, I've heard magnet uh, schools as well. and. I, I don't know if there are, there are others, but what, what is the distinction here? So in America, uh, every family uh, is zoned for a uh, neighborhood right. traditional district public school. And um, uh, back in 1991, uh, in Minnesota, it was the first state passed a charter school law. Charter schools were, were formed to give educational entrepreneurs an opportunity to run their own schools, uh, be a little bit of, uh, create some independence from the district, uh, identify their own teachers, identify their own principals, be managed by a board. Uh, so it's really more of an independent school. And of course, private schools have always been schools where uh, you, you have to pay tuition to go to them. Uh, charter schools are free. They are, they are public schools, so they receive a certain level of funding, uh, state, local, and federal. Uh, private schools require families to pay tuition. Uh, and for a long time, uh, the only folks that have been able to afford uh, private schools are people with means. And so we've always believed that, um, you know, everybody should be able to afford uh, a private school and everybody should be afforded the opportunity to go there if that's the best fit for your child. And in our view, uh, we really ought to be sector agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the United States is a little bit of an outlier here. Mm -hmm. uh, because pluralism is something that's very common in, in Western democracies, uh, where you have a system where the, gov where the government you know, regulates uh, but does and funds but does not operate schools. So we are a little bit of an outlier here. This is something that's relatively common in most Western democracies, but yet here uh, it's not, and it's been, it's been a struggle. Um, and again, I think if you want to have uh, a system that is going to give every child access to a quality education, uh, and you really want a, a system that's going to, uh, the, the, where, where families are going to have the freedom uh, to take a look at the various educational options and identify the one that's going to work best for their child, you got to have these choices. You know, I, I've read, or but maybe we are actually talking about this, you know, previously, but that Sweden is a country where there is a lot of this educational pluralism. You know, uh, uh, so something America perhaps can learn from Sweden, is this, is this right? Oh, what, what, could they, what, could, what could America learn? Uh, well, what, could, what America yeah. learned from Sweden and, and places like the Netherlands uh, mm -hmm. is that you know, money ought to just follow the child. Uh, it shouldn't matter. At the end of the day, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? What we're trying to accomplish is we're trying to make sure that every child gets a great education. So it shouldn't matter whether the child is getting a great, a great education at the school down the street, at a charter school or private school, a virtual school or, or home school. What matters is we're trying to educate our children. We're trying to, we're trying to create uh, a system where our children are going to be successful and competitive in the 21st century and where every child has the opportunity to reach their full potential. That's what this is really about. Um, and so how has Sweden done it, or so effectively, I guess? Is... Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't mind. They're, they're sector agnostic. So it, it doesn't matter whether you're in a when, private what, school. What, can you explain to me sector agnostic? I don't So totally sector understand. agnostic. So here, uh, every family is zoned. Oh, I see. Okay, for their so it has to do with the region. Right. Okay, so they're, okay. they're, they're, they're zoned for yeah. their traditional district school. Uh, their, their traditional district government-run school. Uh, and in most Western democracies, uh, you don't have that. Uh, the money just follows where the child wants to go, uh, where the family wants to send the child, which is a much more which is a much more sensible system. Uh, and you know, it isn't like there aren't uh, you know unions uh, in in, <laughs> in other parts of the world, uh, but for some reason uh, here. Um, 
the, te the teachers unions, the National Education Association, American Federation for Teachers, are just vehemently opposed to this notion uh, that families ought to be able to choose the best environment for their kid. Uh, and again, um, private schools don't pay dues, charter schools don't pay dues, so the fewer members for the union if you don't have enough dues paying members. Um, and it's, um, it, it remains puzzling um, and I just, I keep, I keep believing that we are going to turn this corner uh, where policymakers are just going to say, you know what, this is just the right thing to do and if we have all of this support, uh, across ideological lines, across demographic lines. You know, I really do believe what we're going to get there. I feel very optimistic about this. So you have, so charter schools, if I understand this right, are basically something like a private school but with government funding through th this voucher system? If that's so not a voucher yeah, system. Okay. So, so charter mm -hmm. schools are funded in the same way that traditional public schools are okay. funded. So they get a certain, uh, certain amount of local funds, certain amount of state funds, and then a certain amount of federal funds. But they are quasi-independent. Um, now, of course, what we have seen uh, over the Do they have years, to be geographically in the same area where the no, student is? No. No, it's totally up to the operators okay. uh, where they're going to start these. Uh, you know, in every, every you know, there's 44 states plus the District of Columbia that have charter schools. Uh, and every state has a little bit different law. Uh, some are, are, are much better than others. Um, you know, and we like, uh, we like charter laws where there's kind of an independent uh, charter board uh, or a university that, that could uh, sponsor these charter schools. In most states, uh, it's school districts that sponsor charter schools. And school districts have very little incentive to sponsor charter schools because children will be leaving and <laughs> going to charter schools, which they're not, uh, which they're not too fond of. Uh, but they're quasi-independent schools. Um, but what's happened over the years uh, is that um, there has been um, a lot of regulation of charter schools. And, and so I'll, I'll give you a brief example of this. Uh, back in 2003, I was doing the education policy work for the uh, Schwarzenegger campaign in California, okay. uh, the Arnold campaign, mm -hmm. uh, which was a fascinating adventure. Um, and I began looking at the charter school code. Cal California was one of the um, early, er, early um, uh, authorizers of charter schools and their charter law was passed in the mid-90s. So when that law first passed, the charter school code it was about 10 pages. Uh, this is the mid-90s. By 2003, when I was doing this research on what had happened over those years, I mean, the code had exploded to something like 200 pages. Uh, and so this was an example of uh, the entrenched interests in education wanting to go in there and over-regulate charter schools and essentially try to make them clones of the traditional public schools that families wanted to leave. And so this is yet another battle in the education reform world where we're trying to make sure that uh, charter schools really do uh, retain that autonomy uh, to be innovative, to do things a little bit differently, which is why families chose them in the first place. So tell me about these vouchers that I keep hearing about. I mean, this is, again, for the benefit of our audience, just people who may want to take advantage of these yeah. different opportunities. So currently there, yeah. are, uh, there are three different kinds of what we, what we refer to as private school choice programs. Uh, there's a traditional voucher uh, where the family receives uh, funds, usually state funds, and those funds go to a particular private school of family's choice. Uh, there's something called tax credit scholarships, uh, where we have corporate or and or individual donors who will donate to nonprofit scholarship granting organizations in the states, and those scholarship granting organizations will issue scholarships to eligible families. Uh, and then the third type is something called education savings accounts, and these are relatively new, uh, and we're really excited about education savings accounts. Uh, and this is uh, these are accounts that parents control. And uh, the state portion, whatever the, whatever the student re would receive from the state, would be deposited into this account. And families can use this for private school tuition, for transportation, for special needs services. So a menu of, of, of options, a very flexible. Uh, and so those are really the three types of, of, of private school choice. And then what about ma magnet schools? What are, what so are, magnet yeah. schools are public schools. Mm -hmm. um, you, you typically have to test into them. Um, so, so there is some self-selection even in traditional public schools. Mm -hmm. um, and, and magnet schools are fabulous. Uh, they don't exist everywhere, um, uh, but they're typically very good schools. Um, and we think that that's wonderful. 
Um, you know, again, I mean, we, we just believe that there should be a, a whole lot of options for families to choose from. And the magnet schools so then wouldn't be regionally kind of constrained for the family, like people could kind of go out of their region to that school. Is yes. That, that right? Yes. Okay. And in fact, uh, now that you mention that, there is another form of choice, which is called open enrollment. Mm -hmm. uh, because for many years, if you were in a particular school district, uh, you couldn't go outside the district. In, in fact, if you were zoned for a particular school, you could not go to the neighborhood next door because that was prohibited. So in, in recent years, a lot of states have adopted these open enrollment policies, which we also think is fabulous. So this will allow a family to say, all right, well, you know what? My public school down the street, it's just not for my kid. Maybe I can find a public school uh, you know, three streets over, that's, pro that's in a different district that I'm not zoned for. So, uh, and we encourage these policies. You know, we think that that's great. Let's tackle a few of the kind of criticisms, I guess, of this of choice that, that I've come across at least. You know, one of them is, you know, basically the funding of charter and magnet schools and so forth actually takes away from the, the system in general. It seems like it, that makes sense. Why would we want to, you know, reduce the, how, how good those, or the funding on those schools that aren't, uh, that aren't you know, special? Very common argument uh, okay. uh, against school choice. Uh, false, but a very common argument. Uh, it is the student that generates the funding. So if the student is leaving the traditional system, the, the traditional system doesn't need the funding because they've, they're, they're educating one less student. Um, okay. that, 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 that's the reality of it. And, um, you know, we also, we, we run into examples, for example, in, in tax credit scholarship programs uh, where opponents will say, well, this is funding, uh, you, you're taking away funding from the traditional system. That's completely false. What, what you're actually doing with tax credit scholarship programs, you have corporate and individual donations going to a scholarship granting organization. You are adding money to the K-12 system. You're not taking away money, you're adding money to it. And so this argument that somehow these choice programs, uh, and it's only on the private choice side. Charter schools, again, they're, they're public schools, so they, they, they get public funding. But on the private choice side, that's a common argument where they say that these, the, the existence of these programs is draining money and simply not true. You know, another thing that I guess has been you know, a debate in the, in, in the news and so forth is whether religious, whether the government should be funding religious schools. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is that playing out right now in your mind? Uh, it's, a, it's a tough subject because there are a lot of folks uh, who do not believe uh, that there should be any public funding going to religious schools. Uh, the Supreme Court happens to disagree with them. Uh, that has been litigated. Uh, uh, currently, uh, the court is considering something called uh, uh, Blaine Amendments. Uh, this is the, es uh, the, the Espinosa case from Montana. Uh, and Blaine Amendments are, you know, they, they are an outdated relic of the 19th century. These were amendments that were placed into state constitutions, which were basically uh, anti-Catholic amendments. Um, uh, they are a relic of the 19th century. They need to be abolished. They need to be removed. Um, but there are a lot of folks who just believe that there should be no public funding going to uh, religious schools or, or institutions for that matter. Uh, but yet, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the government, uh, th there's all kinds of funding that are going to, you know, whether it's hospitals or private universities. Um, but for whatever reason, there always seems to be this focus on K-12. You know, we shouldn't have choice in K-12. You know, we shouldn't have funding, K-12 funding that goes to uh, religious schools or private schools. Um, why is that? I mean, why is it okay in higher ed? Why is it even okay in pre-K, but it's not okay in K-12? It doesn't make any sense, and the students are being shortchanged because of it. This is interesting. I mean, um, these perhaps these are the formative years of the students. Precisely. Right. Precisely. Um, and, and, and they are the critical years. Um, you know, um, I, I have been working on the DC uh, Opportunity Scholarship Program, which is the voucher program here in the city, right. uh, since, uh, since 2007. And I've met uh, a lot of the families who participate in this program. And most of them, Jan, are, they're single mothers. Th there are no dads. 
Uh, and it's these single mothers uh, who have, you know, working two, three jobs, um, who, are, who are zoned for really, really horrible schools. And uh, when you meet these families and you meet these women and you see what it is they're trying to do for their child and everything that they are trying to do to try to get their child into a better environment, a better life, um, it's remarkable. And, um, and, and we, <laughs> we always try to raise this with, uh, you know, with, with some of the folks who represent the unions. Because uh, every now and then we'll, we'll be on panels with these folks. And, um, and we'll say to them, you know, why is it that you can't just, why, why is it that you are so opposed uh, to having low-income families, having the same uh, educational opportunities that you did or that a wealthy family does? This is not right. And with religious schools, you know, it just strikes me. This is about choice. So mm -hmm. if you have, if you practice a particular faith, mm -hmm. you can choose to mm -hmm. send your kid to a school with that faith. Why? And so, what is what is the opposition to that? The opposite. Well, the opposition to it is that you just have folks that just don't believe any public money should go to a religious school. Just, just simply, yeah. simply. Period. Yeah, okay. the, the, these are people who fall back to, well, there has to be a separation of church and state. Well, the court has ruled on this, okay. and, and the, court has, okay. the court has determined that this is actually fine. Um, but again, I'll go back to what I said about being sector agnostic. At the end of the day, what, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? What we're trying to accomplish is that every child has access to a quality education and that every child gets a great education. It should not matter what the structure is. It shouldn't matter if it's public, charter, or private. So John, something that occurred to me is uh, all the parents that are invested or interested in school choice are very motivated parents, you know, looking for these great outcomes for their kids. Probably most parents aren't quite that level of motivated, right? And so there's this, is, there's this danger of all these kids kind of being left behind. And, and secondly, I guess, if we are creating these great outcomes for the folks that are seeking school choice, you know, is it just that every, you know, everybody else isn't just getting that same mm -hmm. quality education? Um, I've been thinking about this. It's a difficult concept in my mind. What are, your, what are your thoughts? So my view of this is I think that you got to help as many kids as you can right now uh, because there's urgency to this. And, and I think back of uh, Harriet Tubman. If someone had said to Harriet Tubman, you know, if you cannot free all the slaves, you shouldn't try to free any of them. And thank God she didn't take that advice and she continued to work at it. And that's the way that I see this. I think you are always going to have uh, some parents who are more motivated than others. Uh, uh, but if you have lower income families who uh, recognize that there are other options out there for them, uh, they're going to take advantage of those options. They want what's best for their kids. And I think once that happens, um, those families also come back to their neighborhoods, you know, and they talk to the other families and they say, you know what, we were able to get out of this school. Here's how we did it. We went to this charter school. We got a scholarship to go into this private school choice program. And I think that, you know, you get those conversations going in the neighborhoods and I think you'll find more and more families who will become motivated to do it once they see their neighbors taking advantage of it. And I guess ultimately if there is a you know, sort of larger group of people that are doing this it would probably raise the whole system, I suppose, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think the more, uh, I think the, the, the more options that we make available for, for families, uh, I think the more motivated families become. Uh, and, you know, every family, every parent, um, you know, particularly lower income parents, they want what's best for their children. Uh, and you know, I've, I've been working here in Washington, D.C. for many years, uh, working on this uh, on the D.C. voucher program, and you know, having met so many of these families, uh, they want what's best for their kids. Uh, they are also pretty savvy educational consumers. They know what works and what doesn't, and they know what's going to work for their child and, and what's not going to work. And again, while you can't, uh, you may not be able to get everybody out. Uh, of an environment that's not working for them, once it starts, uh, you know, it, it, it will begin to snowball. And I do believe that families will communicate with one another uh, and, and you will ultimately get even more motivated families who want to do this. We're, we're here in the middle of, or I guess towards the end of National School Choice mm -hmm. Week. You know, this is what 
you know, kind of put you on my radar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how is your organization involved in this? So we uh, we are we are involved in a number of ways. Um, we operate in about. 15 to 18 states each year, uh, plus we do some work here in Washington, D.C. So our folks on the ground in various states are participating in organizing National School Choice Week activities. Uh, this is a wonderful thing that we're doing. So it's awareness raising, is that the... It's yeah. awareness raising. Um, it's a celebration of all the work that um, school choice advocates have been doing over many years. Uh, it is highlighting uh, how school choice has so positively affected so many children's lives and so many families. Um, and it's just a great opportunity to kind of, you know, ring the bell, wave the flag. Um, it's, uh, we, we kind of joke about whether this is a good time for National School Choice Week because it's a little cold in January in many parts of the country and a lot of these uh, events are outside. You know, we try to do rallies at state capitals. It's really cold, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's also a time where uh, most state legislative sessions, uh, well, they're in session. And so it's a good time to kind of wave the flag, raise the issue, elevate the issue, and try to grab the attention of policymakers to say, you know what, you need, your, you need to put your foot on the gas here, and we need to expand options for families. So what portion of students in the U.S., I don't know if you have this, this number, are doing school choice as opposed to the regular system? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so if you look at uh, just private school choice programs and charter schools, there's about 3.7 million children uh, who are participating in either charter schools or private school choice programs. That's less than 0.5 percent. Less than 0.5 percent. Now, if you add in uh, homeschoolers, if you add in all of the other children who are in private schools not getting scholarships, if you add in magnet schools, if you add in open enrollment, you probably take that number to about 10, 12 percent, uh, maybe even higher than that. Um, I think the last time we looked hard at this, there was about around 82 percent, I think, are in uh, uh, schools that they are zoned for. They're assigned government schools. Um, and it, it, it's, it's funny because we just uh, we did our national poll last week, and one of the questions that we asked is, uh, well, uh, if you had another choice, would you take it, other than your traditional assigned school? And you know, fifty percent said yes. Fifty percent. Fifty percent would would do it. Would would take another option. Wow, and we're so you have a long ways to go. A long ways to, and that and it's so interesting that uh, I mean. It, it, I think this number puts it in perspective. And how, ha, how is it this year compared to 10 years ago? Uh, great. Uh, so uh, in the last 10 years, uh, the number of students participating in private choice programs, so vouchers, tax credit scholarships, education savings accounts, uh, has doubled. So we're at about uh, just about 520,000 kids. Uh, which is wonderful, and there's been tremendous momentum over the last 10 years or so, and not just for the private choice programs, but also for charters, uh, a lot of growth in charters. Um, so the momentum is good, um, but there's always, um, there's always a, a, a little bit of fatigue that sends in, uh, because this is hard work. Um, you, you know, you're fighting, uh, you really are fighting an entrenched, a very entrenched bureaucracy. Again, a $700 billion system with a lot of adult interests in it. Very hard. It doesn't turn on a dime. Uh, and it's very hard to make change. Uh, folks are very resistant to change. But we've been chipping away at it and chipping away at it. Uh, we're making good progress. Uh, we would like to go faster. Uh, I think many of the people who fund our work <laughs> would like to see us go faster. Uh, but I think if we, if we stick to it, if we're persistent, uh, if we continue to uh, showcase how this is uh, so positively affecting uh, children's lives, um, I, I, I think we're going to get there. And I really do believe that, uh, I, I believe history is on our side. Uh, I believe that educational choice is a civil rights issue of this century. Uh, and I believe it's crucial, uh, you know, for our success as a nation going forward. That's very interesting. You know, you say the civil rights issue of the century. That's that's a bold, I guess, a, a bold claim. Very bold. Um, <laughs> um, it, education is the domain of the states, as I've learned, you know, from numerous guests that we've mm -hmm. had on this issue. It's an important one to our show. Mm -hmm. um, 
there's there are federal government initiatives mm -hmm. that what I've heard people say that they're excited about. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so the federal government provides just about 10 percent of total funding uh, for K-12 education. But not decision making, right? It's just is well. It uh, so the feds provide about $70 billion. Okay. Uh, they prescribe precisely how this is to be used, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little frustrating. Um, uh, what we are excited about as an organization uh, is a proposal uh, called Education Freedom Scholarships. Uh, and Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos uh, offered this proposal uh, early last year. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a federal tax credit scholarship program. Uh, and I want to be clear about how I describe this. Um, so like tax credit scholarship programs in the states, you would have corporate and individual donors who would make donations to in-state scholarship granting organizations. They would then hand out the scholarships uh, to families. Um, it would not be a federal program. It would be a program where the states would decide who's eligible, the states would decide what the families could spend the money on, and so under the current proposal, they could spend the money on uh, private school tuition, transportation, special needs services, tutoring, after school care. Uh, they could spend it on um, a career and technical education. Very important issue. Uh, bipartisan support for career and technical education because we are finally realizing hey, perhaps college isn't for every kid, but you know what? Let's get them trained in a particular trade. Uh, and so education freedom scholarships could, could also be used for that. We think this is a great idea. It absolutely respects federalism. It respects the notion that states really are in charge of, 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 of education. So it's a $5 billion proposal. Uh, and again, I, I want to be clear about this. Not only is it not a federal program, not only would it not take money from the current education system, it would add money to it. Uh, and we think that's a good thing. So we're, we're hopeful uh, that we can get this thing uh, through Congress. Not an easy thing to do. Um, we have bills uh, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, we have over 100 co-sponsors in the, in the House, and I think we're up to 14 co-sponsors in the Senate. So we're going to keep at this. We think that this is something that has bipartisan appeal. Uh, and so we're going to keep working at it. I think it's the most exciting federal proposal on education that's come out in 20 years. Really? Absolutely. Oh, very interesting. So we, you know, we had Secretary DeVos on some time, some time ago, I think early on when, we, when this was uh, you know, being put out. So how, you know, how, how close are we? To, to seeing action on this or just some decisions being made one yeah. way or so, the other? Um, so in election years, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get things through Congress. <laughs> uh, they are focused on other things. Um, uh, as you know, they, yes. they are currently focused on removing the president. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to be successful at doing that. Um, uh, but I, you know, our, our, our strategy is to continue to build support in Congress, uh, recognizing that not a lot gets done in these election years. Our strategy is we're going to continue to build support in the House. We're going to continue to build support in the Senate. We're going to get all these folks on the record in support of this. Uh, lightning could strike towards the end of the year, maybe in an end of year budget deal where we could slip this in, uh, or more likely uh, as we head into 2021 when we've put the election stuff behind us and we're now focused on actually creating and moving policy, uh, we think we got a good chance to get this done. It'd be a huge win for families. And so, uh, you know, in addition to this, are there any other sort of new initiatives that are kind of being pushed forward by, I guess this, could you call it a coalition of mm -hmm school choice folks? Yeah, so we, um, it, it's very interesting. Um, you know, our, uh, our movement has a lot of, um, you know, really dedicated and smart people who sometimes have difficulty working together towards mm -hmm. the same goal. <laughs> uh, so whereas we are an organization that uh, recognizes that, uh, you know, the federal government uh, is investing $70 billion a year in K-12 education, and to the extent that money is going to be available, uh, we would like to see that money leveraged in the best possible way that's going to help the most families. Uh, there are other folks who believe that the Fed shouldn't have anything to do with education, right. that the Federal Department of Education should be abolished. Um, and, you know, whatever funds the, the Feds want to do, we'll just send it to the states and let them do whatever they want with it. Well, um, that's not 
going to happen. And okay. so, um, you know, so our view is, you know, let's try to leverage the federal money that exists today, and let's try to figure out ways where we can directly empower families with these funds. And there are a lot of good proposals out there. Uh, there's education freedom scholarships, which I mentioned. Yes. Uh, there has been a proposal to do uh, education savings accounts for children and military families. We are fully supportive of that. Um, so that that's sort of money going directly into these funds through the employer. Yes. Yeah. So, well, not through the employer. What what this would be is we would it would create a fund uh, that the families would would operate, and if you are uh, a military family, uh, you would be eligible to to receive this. Um, there are some good schools in and around military bases. Uh, for example, Department of Defense School, pretty good schools, uh, but unfortunately, uh, most of the children in military families are attending the traditional public school that that's around the bases, and not a lot of great schools. And so, you know, given everything that military families uh, are doing for our nation, the sacrifices that they make, um, we would love to see some way uh, to create these ESA accounts for military families so they could at least choose a better school for their child. And there are other proposals. Um, the, uh, most of the federal money uh, is part of something called the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Uh, which is which is authorized every five or six years, and that's where that's where most of the money is. Okay, uh, and that's technically up for reauthorization uh, next year, uh, and we would love to see uh, those funds loosened up a little bit. You know, let's have fewer federal uh, f uh, federal prescriptions about how to use the funds, and let's figure out a way to direct those funds down to the states and down to the families and allow them. Uh, to have better control over them. So there's a lot of stuff that's out there. Um, but again, it's just, um, you know, you got to educate members, uh, you got to make the case to them, and you got to keep at it. So that's interesting. That would be a, an outcome that you would like to see for next year. Let's say, you know, for this year, you've got, you've got your, your, your plan, you've got your goals. What's, what's the best outcome we could see in 2020? So the best, the best outcome at the federal level that we could see in 2020, um, ideally we'd get education freedom scholarships passed. Um, it's gonna be tough. Um, so short of that, uh, continue to build support, uh, get lots of uh, members of the House and members of the Senate on the record in support of it. Uh, continue to build support out in the states, uh, not only in support of this proposal, but for us, um, you know, so much of our work is out in the states anyway, and they are the laboratories. Right, uh, it's easier to get things done out in the states, and so we will continue to work with governors and state legislatures uh, to continue to expand parental choice in the states. Uh, and I think uh, I'm very optimistic about the state work. Uh, there's a lot of great governors out there uh, that are very committed to this, who are willing to make this a governing priority. Uh, I think of governors like uh, Ron DeSantis uh, in Florida, uh, Bill Lee in Tennessee, uh, Doug Ducey in Arizona. Um, uh, Governor DeWine uh, and Lieutenant Governor Husted in Ohio. Th these are folks who are deeply committed to education reform uh, and they want to figure out ways to uh, further empower uh, families in these states. And I, I feel very optimistic that we could get some progress in 2020 in many states. Well, John, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Jan, thanks so much. Enjoyed it.